Hello again. To say I've just had a far-reaching conversation with Ken King would probably be a massive understatement of what we've just been talking about, but we certainly had a lot of fun. So the conversation covers creativity, education, and mostly, and quite interestingly, culture. So how do you bring culture into a organization? How do you bring culture into um, a company or a sports team or even just your home life or whatever? We get quite deep, i.e. very deep, on this idea of culture. Where does it come from? How do we do it? The reason we talk about it so much is because Ken King is right now working on a startup to measure culture. And you think about that, and I was curious about this probably about as much as you are right now. How do you measure culture? Is culture even a thing that has a number to it? What tools and kit do you use to measure culture? Isn't that a massive privacy concern for a lot of people if you're going to try and measure culture? We get into all of that on this episode. I think you're going to really enjoy it. It's probably one of my most serious episodes for quite a while, but Ken's awesome He's got a lot of great insights, and I think you're going to love it. Cue the music. There we go. I've got to get out of the habit of saying we're live now, because we're not live. (laughs) Well, I was I was just starting to feel that beat right as it came to an end. So it's it's a good thing it's a good thing you ended it because I wouldn't have been able to keep talking. I would have been out of breath from dancing. <laughs> yeah, you're do, <laughs> doing a lot of dancing at the minute, aren't you? On TikTok. You know what? I dumped TikTok. I dumped it last week. Oh, did you? I did. Um, when they when Instagram came out and the algorithm started to select against the cross post of TikToks in favor of Reels. Um, it made it less viable for us because we were really trying to use it as a bit of a marketing tool and not being able to cross post on Instagram was a non-starter. So literally just deleted the account, gone. All right. I wasn't even aware of this thing. So they, they're they da- what? So if you post stuff on TikTok now, they're downgrading it on Instagram. Yeah. If you, if you, cause it, it it's, you've got that auto save to the phone function mm. and because they've come out with reels, which is their, their version of TikTok, um, the algorithm will select against that TikTok cross post. So I'm not, not that we're not that the algorithm is really working for me in too many ways on any of my social media, but I don't need it working <laughs> against me any more than it already is. So what do you mean? It's not working for you. Uh, well, I guess it, it's not working for me because I'm not, I'm not, paying attention. <laughs> I, I get, I, I'm like you in a sense, and we've talked about this before. I, I'm more comfortable on Twitter. I like the interaction more. I like that. You don't, there's not as, there's not as much fluff and you actually get to connect with people a little bit better. Yeah. And so because of that, we have, we have a social media manager and she's, she's running our, a lot of the company Instagram accounts and we have some, some of the aspects of my Instagram account, even our, our planned posts. And it's just not my bag. I just, I, I, I don't, I don't find Instagram to be, it doesn't really align with what I'm trying to do. And you, you almost have to be on it in a, in a sense, especially for our, our education and our, our sports side. Cause a lot of our market is on it, but, um, the Twitter side is where we get, we get legs on Twitter off stuff way more often. And yeah, I just, I think it's as, as you said to me before, it's your, it's your platform of choice and it's becoming mine quickly. So Instagram algorithm has started to work against me because I'm just not active in the way they want you to be. Yeah. Well, that, that's the problem of, of them all really. Once you're not active on them, they're all promoting. It's, it's a little dirty secret that a lot of people don't know they're all promoting time in app. So they all want you, they all want you on their app all day long. And if, if you use scheduling tools or you, you try it, you try any way to stay off of the platform, they don't like it. And the, the only platform I've found 
where they don't really penalize you for that is Twitter. But Facebook and Instagram, I'm not so familiar with TikTok, so I can't comment on that. But I know Instagram and Facebook penalize you quite heavily for for not having a high time in app. Um, Basically not sitting there scrolling on it all day long. Um, Twitter... Twitter just feels different. It prioritizes, it feels like it prioritizes good content more than the rest of them. And also the kind of, the caliber of person I find on Twitter is higher than versus Instagram. It, I've, I've always find it quite funny with the visuals that I do, with the with the unobvious visuals. Watching them perform on Twitter and Instagram is, is always really interesting. And I know that it, it's hard to figure that out sometimes because one, I've got a much bigger following on Twitter than I have on Instagram. But at the time when I started both of them, they were fairly similar. But one of them has taken off way more than the other one. And then when you actually compare some of the visuals, it's always the visuals that are a little bit clever that never do well on Instagram. And the only conclusion I can come to is that people are just stupid on Instagram. (laughs) And uh, that's why Twitter's better. So there you go. <laughs> well, not to mention the fact that the whole premise of Instagram is supposed to be for quality visual. Like yeah. That's the, the purpose of the app is is really to display unique and quality visuals. So the fact that your visual work is not taking off on the platform speaks to what has happened to the original vision for that platform. Yeah, I spoke quite a lot on one of my old episodes to a guy called Connor Fowler. He's a designer like me, and he used to use Instagram a lot. And he used to, a lot of designers did. They used to use it to promote a lot of their work. And he, he talked a lot about how search has been broken, so search doesn't work properly anymore, and how um, basically how discoverability has been broken, hashtags don't really work anymore. All of the kind of stuff on there just, doesn't work anymore because they just they just want you uh, presumably on there as a consumer liking and commenting on everything um yeah it's 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 a weird one i i've just never really felt at home with instagram um i use it out of kind of necessity although to be honest i could shut the account down and it wouldn't really make much difference but yeah i I just kind of keep sticking at it but i i want to come back I want to come back to a thing that you said just a minute ago. Mm-hmm. Um, it's you feel more at home on Twitter because it feels like it promotes the things that you're doing better. We should really start there. What is it the things? <laughs> <laughs> what is it the things that yeah. you're doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess the tip, the typical podcast or, or show run would would actually be to explain a bit of mm. what exactly those things are and and. Uh, one of the one of the challenges has been is we made a major pivot during a pandemic and we took that risk. Uh, we were a training and education, more of a consulting company in performance and and learning and and really growth. And I a friend of mine, Trevor Reagan, does a great job of it. And I was trying to do my own version of of kind of what he does. And he's flat out just the best at what he does in terms of digest making challenging content digestible for a wide range of people so they can apply it to their lives. And the biggest thing for me about training and consulting, whether it was with my company or with the company I worked for previously that was doing it inclusion and diversity, it's infinitely unscalable. Somebody has to be in the room and, and you're, you're always telling people what they need and that they need you. And so as we looked at that, as the pandemic was starting, I was like, I think we should try and take the leap into measuring what groups are actually doing now objectively, not with surveys. Cause those are crap. They, people lie on them. They're full of bias. They, they, they strongly select against people who where the first language of the survey is not their first language. Other different uh, Im- immigrant challenges can, can really make survey data bias, especially in the workplace. But yet all these big companies still use it. 
And then even still, we were still at that inclusion and diversity company in particular, able to come in and tell people that they needed our training and they wouldn't base anything off data. So we created some data methods to measure culture and work in the workplace environment. Same thing for sport as well. And we were running that manually. And then I don't know if I just got restless or, or I just realized that the problem was still the same where it's like, this is still not scalable. We still need to put people in the space to, to actually do the observation, the measurement and calculate the data. Like, well, damn it, we should make it into a software and, and we should, we should have this software be able to be integrated into existing security cameras, which are already in places that are public domain mm. and measure using AI and, and some learning, some, some machine learning and empathetic tech measure culture in real time. So we can see why performance is good, why performance needs some work, what parts of the day are things lagging. And we can, we can use that to help individuals perform better, help groups perform, perform better, reduce turnover, reduce lost time and sick days and that kind of thing. And, and, and blah, blah, blah. So what I do now is try to keep my head on straight while trying to raise money to build a software and, and produce a podcast and write a blog and same thing as you, I think what I, what I do now is try and learn and do my best every day to, to only do things that I really give a shit about and not things that I don't feel are helping me pursue that vision of being able to change workplace and sport culture by measuring it more accurately. What was the, what was the realization? Why did you switch from what made you realize, oh, maybe this is not going to work in terms of starting a training company or what made you actually realize that that wasn't the path that you wanted to go on and then you started pivoting? One of the key things, there's actually two, two major turning points. The first was when I left the company that I was working with, they tried to sue me for the IP of this idea uh, when I published it on my own. Mm. And so you had to stop then. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I didn't have to stop. What actually happened was I published it open access. Like I wrote a blog and I said, this is my idea. It's out there. Right. And that's when they came after the IP, which I knew was mine. And, and I won. And th the light bulb kind of went off if somebody is willing to do that for this idea, maybe there is something here. Cause as with most people, you just think like, it seems ridiculous until somebody, well, until hundreds or thousands of people tell you it's not, I'm, I'm sure Steve jobs actually, even in his book, there was so many times where he, where he really felt like the idea for the iPhone was silly. Mm. But it was that like vindication of like, not only did I defend that it is mine and I came up with this, but somebody wanted to fight to take it. That really changed my perspective on it. And then the other one was when we pitched the idea to Hyatt Hotels, which by the way, just bought up a big stake of property in the UK and, and other parts of Europe during the pandemic. Um, when we pitched to them, they loved it. And, and like, I've never, I'm a, I, I have that self doubt that everybody has. I hide it probably better than most, but I really thought that I was making up like a sci science fiction concept. And so it was, it was really just kind of those, those couple of vindicating moments of somebody wanted to take this from me. And now somebody actually wants to pay me for it. that first time as, as I'm sure like it's, it's very similar in the creative world when, when you actually get paid for your work, even if it's a dollar, mm. holy crap, somebody, somebody gave me their hard earned money. They work every day for this. And somebody gave me their money so that I could share this idea with them. And from that point on, it's just been like, this is, this is, there's a better way to do this than the, the better way to measure culture. And, and now I really believe in the idea. And I guess the, the kind of two B to that as well would be the amount of people that tell me culture, you can't measure culture. And then that's like a common saying in sport. Mm. You can't measure, it's an intangible. You hear that all the time. What, what's the intangibles? 
It's like, well, what if it was a tangible? Like, there was a lot of things that we think that at one point we thought were intangible. And we've tangibilized a lot of stuff. So why not this? So in, in terms of culture, then, what you mean that it, in sports or in a workplace or whatever, that uh, that reason why people keep turning up, those kind of shared values, that, that kind of thing, is that what you mean by culture, measuring that? Yeah, we base we base a lot of our work off the big five personality, so individual personality cues in in the people involved in the group, how they act and react to situations, as well as Hofstede's six dimensions of culture, and and in there, we're really talking about the basic way to frame it is just that how we act and react to with each other, mm. and situations that arise, and that that action and reaction is guided by alignment to mission, vision, values, and shared experience. So mm. now trying to pump all that into a AI software is really the, the uphill battle that we're in now. So, <laughs> But what are you trying to pump into AI software? What, what, how, how do, I don't even understand. I don't even know how to phrase a question about it. Just... <laughs> How? Um, <laughs> a lot of it is so empathetic tech is new. It's one of the scarier techs because it's very Terminator like. Like it's it's really building emotional reactions into technology. So that's so that's a thing. Empathetic tech. That's like a the, what you call this thing. Yeah, I don't know that we fit directly in that box. I think like I, I was actually just when I was driving today to teach a class over at the university. I was, I was thinking about what we would be cause we're, we're not really right in that empathetic tech or that, that humanistic tech. Uh, we're, we're not really in, in like a business tech. Like we don't, we don't analyze, analyze margins and that kind of stuff. We're more, it's more like it's culture tech. I, I think that that's the way that I would describe it. But Without giving in to any of the secret sauce, there's a way to put markers on what people say and how people behave that can be picked up by microphones and cameras. That sounds creepy. Yeah, and you know, you're not the first person on a show to call me creepy, and I've just gotten used to it, um, <laughs> for better for worse. Because it's we're working. We we've been in contact now multiple times with the Center for Humane Technology, and they created that that uh, really good documentary, uh, Social Dilemma. Yeah. And we're, we're, it's really important to me that our tech is inclusive because inclusion is actually one of the measures that we, that we, or the potential for high, for inclusion in a space is what we, is what we track. And so we don't need any iPhone situations where if you're not white, we can't measure your behavior. Like that's, we don't need any of that kind of damage coming up, but we also really want people to feel confident that they as an individual are not being tracked. Their behaviors and what they say is being recorded, coded, and then destroyed. And so in, in a matter of milliseconds. So that is one of our biggest friction points is how, how do you make it really feel non-invasive and really show that the, the benefit of this tracking far outweighs the cost of what you say and how you act being coded by a computer because your workplace or your sport team is going to perform better. You're going to be happier and more inclusive, more mentally healthy, et cetera, et cetera. So, but yeah, I, I, I a little, little bit creepy on the surface. That's for sure. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not going to deny anybody who says like, so you're going to track what I say and how I move and act. Yes but nobody's ever going to know it was what you said or how you moved and act. Yeah. It's going to just come out to a metric. I guess, I guess the issue would it'd be if you were actually going to install it in a company, everybody would have to opt in or opt out. Right. And if you get some people opting out, I, how they couldn't even be in that room, could they? Or they couldn't even be in the organization. I guess you'd put it in employment contracts and all that kind of thing. But yes, yeah, a bit weird. It's. Did you ever see the Google Glass thing? Yeah. 
Yeah. It reminds me a, a little bit of, of that in terms of the privacy concerns that that had. I mean, that was people recording people walking around, basically. Uh, yeah. and, and then they, they got, I think they got a bunch of lawsuits in a couple of countries, and then they ended up pulling the entire idea, as Google often do, because they couldn't deal with the privacy concerns. Basically, people walking around filming people um, with little cameras right next to their eyes. So I, I guess in some ways, I guess it's a little bit like that. And I bet the privacy stuff is going to be just as hard to deal with, if not harder than the actual tech. The tech probably won't be as complicated. <laughs> and it is very individualized too. Like we can go to China right now and nobody needs to sign off on anything. We can put it <laughs> in every office building. Mm. Um, and we could store all the data and it, it wouldn't matter. We could, we could record names and add, like we could do whatever we wanted. And, and there's a lot of States in the U S and, and areas of Canada and the UK, Europe as well, where, um, it's standard to have that, that aspect of the contract that, that, that essentially falls under the privacy of being recorded on security cameras mm. because that's and that's really the way I describe it to people is your workplace has security cameras and they actually are recording the image and storing it. We're going to use those same hardware interfaces to capture the data, but we'll never, but we will actually won't save nearly as much as what security cameras already access. So the audio piece is challenging. Yeah. Um, the audio piece is really difficult and, and the goal, my, my goal is to remove the need for audio and be able to make it so accurate on the video capture that we don't need it. But at this point, the more data, the better. So we're really, we're really kind of trying to keep that in, but at some point we'll be in a meeting somewhere and we'll be deciding whether or not we want to dump the audio side or it's, or we're able to keep it and keep going. And, but that's just that's way down the startup tech list of concerns for me right now. Mm. Right now, I'm just looking for people with uh, checkbooks and <laughs> belief in an idea. And then late, later on, we'll be we'll be talking about the audio privacy concerns. But honestly, I I feel comfortable with the with the video capture side. I I, I actually think it's less invasive privacy wise than security footage is, CCTV that kind of thing. Well, it's it. It's the hot top. The reason I mention it is the hot topic at the minute, isn't it? It's mm-hmm. pr- privacy is a concern for a lot of people. Um, e- e- even to a point for me now, where I've previously, you know, I'm I'm in the game. You know, I'm I'm in marketing. I run a digital agency. I know how all this kind of thing works. Most of our clients want to track every last thing of everything that they get, and privacy has never really been a, a, a concern. People don't think about the user, but. N- now people, hold on, that's my fire alarm going off. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, it's gone. Uh, my girlfriend's obviously ruined ruined dinner. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yes, yeah, yeah. So people are getting more aware of privacy and 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 things like what Apple are doing as well. Like they're they're putting it back in in the hands of you. What once you once you let that cat out of the bag once you make people aware of how much they're being tracked people never say yes to that to that stuff do they it, even if it doesn't really affect them you know being a track being tracked by a, a website you know your browser data it's not it's not really a big deal but if you give somebody an option to say do you want to be tracked on this website yes or no they'll say no every time what they? they just you don't you don't say yes to that. Yeah, it's like sometimes when you get asked if you want to accept cookies, or you, you, if you don't know the website, you're like, no, I don't want to accept these cookies. I accept the cookies from the website I go to all the time, but this new one, no. Yeah, and it, it, it's like if a sales guy rings you up or whatever, and he asks you if you've got time, you you always say no. But <laughs> all you've been doing for the last ten minutes is is or even hour is browsing Facebook or Twitter. But as soon as a sales guy rings, you know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm at work. I'm busy. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's weird like that. So, in, in well, terms, go on. It's interesting in our proof of concept stages 
there, we were measuring, we, we identified three key factors that would really play into what you're talking about, especially at the workplace. Cause sport is actually easy um, in comparison, because if somebody's there's, there's a high, high level of psychological safety and trust in, in most sport environments. So if your coach comes in or the general manager comes in and says, we're going to use this software, it's going to help the team win. There's it's, it's actually pretty easy. And, and, and the people at the top have an obligation to really protect those inside the organization. Um, really the same obligation as owners and managers of businesses do, but they, it's the connection level is a lot higher in sport. So Sport by comparison is a little bit easier that way. But in the workplace, we were measuring the value of, of privacy against compensation and workplace culture, or effectively how happy you are at work every day and how much stress you take home. And it was very clear with significant statistical differences that people are willing to sacrifice culture, or sorry, to sacrifice compensation to a point, and privacy, if it means that their daily workplace culture is significantly better. And that was, I honestly thought that privacy would remain highest. I knew compensation people, a lot of, a lot of misguided managers and owners think compensation is king hmm. and it generally is, but there's a crux point there where it's like compens you can keep paying people and buying them off, buying them off. But if culture gets so bad, eventually culture jumps and they'll, they'll resign that job. They'll leave that job. They'll go work somewhere else, somewhere else for less with a healthier culture. And it does seem that privacy is the same. And, and, and so our goal is to just stay under that threshold of we're going to, we're going to, we are going to track you, but we're not going to track you so much that it becomes more important to you than your culture at the place that you work improving. Hmm. I think I, I reckon it's probably changed a lot more now as well in terms of compensation over this last year with coronavirus. People, I know for a fact, people I've spoken to, friends and things like that, that, that they've, this whole situation has made them realise that work isn't everything. And it doesn't matter how much compensation you get from that, time is the, is the most important thing for a lot of people now. In fact, a client rang us today saying they're shutting down the company because because of you know not not because of financial reasons just because coronavirus has made them realize that work isn't everything and you, you know that's it thanks for your service but we we've got enough money we're going to shut down we're going to go enjoy our lives so i I, th I think specifically the compensation side of it is maybe going to become even less important for some people well I agree a hundred percent, Craig. And I think that the, I just said to somebody the other day, uh, an owner of a clinic here in Calgary who was considering our services. It's tough. Like we're, we're definitely discretionary spending in a lot of people's mind right now. So it's, it's not necessarily their first priority when they're reopening their business to measure their culture. I believe it should be, but not everybody sees it that way. And I said, I, because he was talking to me about how well he pays his staff. And I just said, I, I wouldn't want to be the businesses that are assuming that money is going to speak as loud post COVID as it did pre COVID. Because if you make that assumption, you're going to, you're going to be making a pretty, pretty big mistake in my opinion. Yeah. I think a, a lot of people have changed their minds to think, is this enough? Um, rather than, hunting for another job well we could, i've seen it in the uk i don't know if it's the same over your way but particularly with the whole work from home thing so this this last year a lot of people have been experiencing this uh better life basically for a lot of for a lot of people working from home been able to essentially get up 20 minutes before they're about to start work. No commute, I think, is probably the most important thing. People have not been sat in cars for an hour on a morning, an hour on an evening, and they get to do what they want half of the time. And most importantly, they're trusted to do their job and they don't have a boss over the shoulder. And I, a, lot, a lot of people in the UK, they, they want to stay like that because why, why wouldn't you want to stay like that? Why wouldn't you want more trust? Why would you not want more freedom? in your job. And I think a lot of people are going to make that decision now that 
when they're being told to come back to the office or whatever, if it's not an option for them to continue working from home, they'll go and find somewhere else. And I, I can guarantee you that compensation is not going to be the first thing they're going to be thinking about. They're going to be thinking about if they can work from home, if they can keep that same work-life balance that they've had over the last year. So in, in that instance, really the thing that they're reflecting on is culture. It's it's that that way of working. And you think, why? well, why do they want to work from home? Well, yeah, there's there's no commute and things like that. But maybe it's just the fact that the culture at the office wasn't right as well. Or they got nothing done, as most people don't in, in open plan offices, which, yeah. which is the way that most offices are. So, yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting topic. So do you give them – so is the culture thing – are you going to give them a score or something? How, how, how does – how does that work? Is there going to be a big number on the wall saying culture is at five today, DEFCON four no, or whatever? <laughs> it's more on a continuum. So we or the whole goal is to orient the culture towards growth. So on one end of the continuum, we have growth, cultural growth, because we believe that cultural growth is directly correlated with group performance. And so you'll either be trending towards or away from growth. And we can put very specific numbers on it, but I don't believe that that's actually useful. I think the trend is more important. So mm. whether or not the behaviors in the group are trending towards growth at any given time is really the goal. And understanding that when you trend towards growth, the the hard metrics that, that some people might consider, profit and lost time and turnover and that kind of thing, go down. And that's well known. That's well established that that healthy workplace culture or growth oriented cultures don't have as high in those areas. And they, they have more engaged, generally happier employees and that kind of thing. So the score, if you will, is really just a trend trending positively towards growth more in a neutral zone or trending away from growth. Mm. Yeah. It always makes me think of, are you familiar with Basecamp? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Jason Freed and um, I can never pronounce his name. DHH. I'll call him DHH. The two two founders of it. They they always they've got a bunch of books out as well. Always talking about culture. Always talking about not working to death. All that kind of thing. And they found a really good balance, I think, between pushing to make cool stuff and not flogging their employees basically not whipping their employees to to work harder uh, i think that's really important something that we've always tried to do that we we never ask anybody to stay behind too late you know it's a nice place to work um you it's flexible you can work at home you can work from the office you can work whatever hours you want all that kind of thing it's just all stuff that you you, you want the people who are working for you to be happy and you want them to stay because even if they're not as quote unquote productive, the the least productive thing that you can have happen in an organization is people leaving all the time and having to bring new people in and onboard new people and change the staff all the time. That is the least productive thing you can be spending your time doing. So yeah, you might not be like mega productive or whatever that means, but people are staying and, and you can actually build a culture yeah, it, it, one of my one of the concepts that conceptualized it really good for me was Mark Randolph's book, the co-founder of Netflix. He talks about how they build their entire culture, and their culture is famous. Like their original slide deck and stuff like that is available online because uh, the other co-founder, Reed Hastings, has spoken about it multiple times. But it can essentially be summed down in two things: freedom and responsibility. You give everybody freedom to work how they work, when they want to work, and that kind of thing but you also give them responsibility to get things done and no arbitrary deadlines and that kind of thing. And, and we've been doing that now for months in our Slack where we have a Slack channel that's just problems to solve. And anybody can go in from any part of our company and pick a problem and just take that problem on. And if they solve it, great. If they don't, they can put it back in. And it's been super effective because not only do you get a diverse array of responses and solutions, but 
there's no deadline attached to that problem unless there is, unless there's an external deadline that we, that, that might be imposed upon us, but we don't really impose arbitrary deadlines. It's like, well, we, we need to figure out how we're going to integrate into this, into this brand of security camera. Somebody will say, okay, I got this. And then I don't, okay, you got it. I don't follow up. I don't, I'm not looking for when, when you, when you're going to get that back to me or have you figured this out yet? And sure, sometimes it just goes back in. They're like, yeah, I couldn't figure it out. But we have some pretty great people and more often than not, that problem gets solved. And it might not even be by a person who has any idea what, like they might not be our, our quote unquote tech side. It could be one of our marketers who comes in and says, well, I actually know somebody who works in this area and, they, and next thing we know, problem solved, check it, move on. And as anybody in a startup knows, that problems to solve list, it doesn't really ever get smaller. There's just another one that kind of takes the spot of the one that you just solved. But I think that Mark Randolph's freedom and responsibility concept is like, that's gold. That's, that's, that's how you need to run a business now. But it's so, it comes to the topic of fear, which is fear from leadership in giving people freedom. They're fine with giving people responsibility, but it's like, well, if I give you too much freedom, then it's like, I'm just burning money. And it's like, really? Have, have you tried it? Have you tried? And, and if you can't trust your people to get their work done without hard deadlines or sitting in a cubicle, maybe that says more about your hiring practices than it does and your, and your culture than it does about the concept itself. Yeah. It's well, it's hard to change something like that. If that's the, what usually happens when somebody starts a company is that they just adopt the thing. It's a bit like parenting, really. They just ad adopt the thing that they understand from whoever did the thing before them. So when they used to work at a different job, they just adopt that thing when they come into actually making their own company. So once you've done that, once you set up your company, you set up the culture or the way of working or whatever you want to call it, and you establish that, and you leave that sitting there for a couple of years, it's so hard to change that because now everybody in that company echoes back that way of working to you. So for you to be able to change that halfway through is hard. So even if people think, you know, even, even if the owner comes to a conclusion and thinks this is not the correct way that we should be working, it's so tough for them to change that. We, we went through it a little bit over this last year with coronavirus, where we've always had this idea that, a self-imposed idea that we we work nine to five, Monday to Friday, just because that's what everybody else does. And, you know, we serve clients, so it helps us work nine to five, Monday to Friday. And we just always, we just adopted that because that's what everybody does, really. You know, it's just the standard work thing. And it wasn't really until coronavirus came around that we thought, well, we'll We'll change it up a little bit. Some people want to work four days a week. Some people want to work less hours. We've been talking about it for a really long amount of time. So we decided, right, well, we're going to work 32 hours a, a week and you can decide when you want to put those hours in on whatever days and whatever way you do it. And we'd never want to go back to that now. But that was a real effort and, and we did it in stages to be able to do it. First of all, we only did it as owners and then we let the employees do it probably because of a, a little bit of a trust issue. And then eventually when we let everybody do it, we realized that nothing really changed and, you know, the world didn't blow up or anything like that. But it, most people who run businesses are, are not as switched on uh, as, as we might be to, to try new ideas out. Most businesses mm -hmm. just continue to do the same thing they always did, don't they? So how how would you even, you know, you just mentioned that book. How would you even make them change something that's so drastic like that? It'd be so hard. Yeah, one of our key metrics is ownership of task. And I think that's, it's a key, having high level of ownership of task is something that comes with trust and you can't really judge ownership of task without giving that trust. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear you even say how the, the owners were kind of in that system already. And then as trust built, it was like, well, let's give everybody a bit of a shot here. And if your culture is poor, 
And when it was, when I, again, so I mean, trending away from growth and the culture and the group does not give people the opportunity to own their task early. So let's like, let's use a McDonald's as an example. If Why that, that? <laughs> Why are we using McDonald's? <laughs> just, just randomly, not because I'm surrounded by their products. Well, their breakfast, just their breakfast products. Because in my mind, their breakfast is healthy, but everything else is bad for you. Mm. Um, <laughs> but they, and actually, as a side note, I'm trying this intermittent fasting thing, so it's like noon here, and I'm, I'm just kind of, I was just starting to eat as we got on. Um, and the intermittent fasting is kicking my butt a little bit. So that's why I'm, my entire diet is a little bit messed up, but that's a tangent. But when we, when we talk about if all you do is hover over somebody as they're flipping your burger and you tell them exactly how to flip the burger every single time and exactly when they've done something wrong, they have no ability to own that task. So if you then transition that person rapidly from that environment where you're hovering over them to actually you're in charge of the store today. So you got to make this burger. You're, you're responsible for the, for the making of the burger. That first little bit is going to be bad. They're going to send out some bad burgers, but they're also starting to own that task now because every bad burger that comes back, Oh, this, this is burnt. This is undercooked. They're learning. And now that there's learning built in, their ownership of task is going up because humans want to do things well. We don't want, we're, we're able to be lazy and we trend towards laziness because that keeps us safe and it's not scary. But we want to do things well when we, when we take ownership of it. And we experience this too, where you transition to that, like I described the problem solving in Slack. Some people just would never pick a problem. And right away, it's like, hey, what are you, so what are you doing? <laughs> like, we, we definitely had a little bit of those conversations. And we definitely had some people that we had to transition away from because that was an environment that was going to work for them on the timelines that we needed to. Because in a startup, we, your timelines are tight. So I do think that the fear-based side is really that you have to be willing to have that rub, that struggle, maintain that growth mindset perspective and let people own their task for a bit, even when they're not doing it elite. Uh. We see it in sport all the time. We talk, we talk about game like practice and randomized practice as opposed to block practice or, or really structured drills. If you want to perform in a game, you have to practice and train randomly game like in a way that's unpredictable. If you want people to perform at a task period, you have to give them the opportunity to, to deal with that task in with all of its ugliness and all of its nuances and all of its, all of its intricacies fail and learn and come back, but it will be worth it. A word that's coming into my mind when you're saying this, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is giving somebody the ability to be creative, basically, um, giving them the, the parameters to be, to approach something in any way that they want, maybe not even a, a, well, you give them the trust to be able to do it, but you basically give them a problem, game day scenario, like you said, unpredictable scenario. They have to get creative in that scenario. A lot of people, well, for a start, education doesn't teach you to be like that. Education no. doesn't teach you to be creative whatsoever. So to to go into a job and somebody to go, you know, here, here's a black box. <laughs> Make this black box pink. <laughs> You're like, I, I, I yeah. don't, where, where's the rules? Can, can you give me some instructions? <laughs> Is there a manual? Uh, yeah. That's really tough for somebody to do. But I guess ultimately what you're trying to do, and I guess what we're all trying to do is pull that creativity out of someone, right? Yeah, and I love that you bring up creativity. And honestly, I love that you bring up the education system too, because this is the second podcast in two days that I've that I've talked about this on. Yesterday it was around mental health and how the education systems and I say systems because I don't know I don't know of really any in the world at this time that that are really doing it any other way. Mm. So here, here's a little history lesson for you, Craig. There used to be something called Upper and Lower Canada. That was how the country was divided originally. I know that, and I've known it since I was about eleven. 
but I didn't know how to do my taxes until I was in my mid twenties. And we don't see a problem with our education system in terms of what it's teaching us. We don't, we don't see, we're not understanding that, that when, for people who are running businesses now, I just saw a tweet the other day. We need more Swiss army knives coming out of school. People who can do anything, figure it out and fill any need. I'm, I'm, I can't hire you to just be my social media manager. You might need to be, you might need to help us with social media. And you're also probably going to help us maybe with a little bit of financial forecasting and some marketing and, and, and you might not, whatever you went to school for, you probably didn't learn all the solutions to those problems. And I definitely don't have time to help you through them all. So you're definitely going to have to be able to create some solutions. And we have this culture growth check-in. It's just a one sheet that we use for, that we send to people for their meetings and we use in meetings and we can break it down really far or not. And this is from, we created it from our data and it's, it's got 16 components that you rank yourself on on a scale of one to 10 in terms of your readiness to create growth and change when you sit down in a meeting or a call or whatever. And I won't go through all 16, but there, but th- we don't have creativity on there explicitly, but we do have, we do have components of it, which is learnability, open-mindedness, task switching, adaptability, and situational awareness, which I think are all v- key components of creativity. We also have humor on there, which I could talk about for a while as a, as a key uh, method to bring into change-based meetings. But it's funny to me, or it's non-coincidental, I should say, that companies like yours that are highly creative-based are the first ones who want to try stuff like this. Hmm. Because the mindsets that are in the room are already ones that, that like, you experience what failure and effort and repetition of, of methods and that kind of thing can get you at the end game. But if I, to your point, if I spent 15 years on assembly line at Ford, one of the, one of the only two car companies in the world to not ever declare bankruptcy in North America, if I'm on assembly line at Ford for 15 years and then I become a manager and I supervise that assembly line, and then I become an upper management. And I supervise an entire plant, and so on and so forth. And you're telling me that I can give I can give people flex hours. I'm telling you, get bent, right? Like, <laughs> it's there's there's no way because Ford's we, we're one of the only we're it's only us and Tesla in North America that haven't gone bankrupt. So why should we change anything? Yeah, and the so. the the truth the truth well the real truth is that once they get through that next generation of people, once all those people that they have right now, Ford, they'll be bringing people up who won't accept that same kind of job. Um, yep. And that's when they'll really start to struggle. Maybe even the environment doesn't even exist anymore. Not even the the fact that they can't find the employees, but maybe that environment doesn't even exist. Uh, and And that's when... That's when they'll start to struggle, because I, th- I think people are, people are, are less accepting of of being in that kind of environment. And most, the majority of people don't. People have high ambitions now, right? They they don't have the same attitude to work. Particularly young people, they don't think right. I need to make money. I'm I'm gonna just do this job for twenty years to make money. They people don't think like that. They want to be, you know, a rock star or a sport you know sports star or whatever and they want to do all the things to get to that so a lot of people are less accepting of that daily grind that was purely invented for ford for companies like ford to take advantage of people really no nobody i mean come on nobody should be stood on an assembly line every day for eight or 12 hours probably 12 hours they probably do 12 hour shifts right doing the same repetitive task over and over and over and over for any length of time, let alone 15 years. It's just, it's not what humans are designed for, is it? No, but it's a really good way to get rich people rich and keep them there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I think, I think we've already seen, it's not as new as people think. Like you mentioned the, the kids and, and the next generation as they, as they come into the workplace and it's definitely going to be magnified, but 
you talk about failure of creativity and problem solving and, and that sort of thing. Look at the pandemic. Look at the leaders that are just frozen and paralyzed because of their inability to get creative and problem solve. Look at the ones that, that have that skill, like in New Zealand. She, she crushed it. She, she got creative with how, how she did things. She wasn't following a quote-unquote plan or anything like that. Look at Goldman Sachs in 2007. They probably could have used some problem-solving creativity. <laughs> uh, that's probably or, the problem. They used too much creativity. That's how they got it. <laughs> yeah. Creativity, I guess, is subjective if, you're, if you worked at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> but, and, and I was actually just talking to one of our colleagues about this the other day where the, the race problem in the U.S., and like we're both middle-aged white guys, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about this like I understand it completely. But in my opinion, from my experiences, the inability of leadership in police departments, in government, in the education system to get creative and problem solve these struggles is, is mind blowing to watch the, the fixed mindset aspects where the, there's just, we're not trying anything like the, I've seen the same rhetoric from as long my entire lifetime easily. And I know it goes on well beyond that from people in leadership and in education, law enforcement and government around, around race, especially in the U S and I know it happens everywhere, but I, the U S pumps out more news than anybody else. So I hear about it a lot more. And I just, it's like, it's been like, 30 some odd years of my life and, and nobody's really said anything different. I have hope for some of them, but we're not really educating any differently. We're not really training any differently. We we've, we've gotten people to take courses on the problem because that's how we've always solved these problems is people take courses on it, but we haven't gotten creative and said like, you need to, you need to spend a day, out of uniform in this neighborhood and get to know some people. We can't get creative with stuff like that. And I just, again, in my opinion, with my experience, we're seeing the failure of leadership to be capable of creative creativity. And it's not just in business. It's in, it's in politics, it's in law enforcement. And many of the problems that are challenging us every day are because somebody's sitting in an office or a high rise or behind a desk or wherever and they they're trying to follow the book that as you said somebody laid out for them they're they're trying to assembly line solution the problem well i think to bring it full circle before we end i think this might all the way come back to culture right so everything from education there's a particular culture you are brought up to be part of that culture. You'll wear the same uniform as everybody else. You'll turn up at the same time as everybody else. You'll learn the same subjects as everybody else in the same rote fashion as everybody else. And then when you move on, and all that's really doing is preparing you to work in an industrial society, really, an industrial revolution type society. I'll call it a revolution now. It's a bit weird. But you you brought up to get up at nine and finish at five and that kind of thing. And then you move on to a job and then you accept the same culture again. That's the same thing. You've got to turn up to work, wear a tie, you know, be or a uniform or whatever. Listen to what your boss says. Not really encouraged to be creative in any particular fashion. You're encouraged to follow rules just like you was at school. And and that, that kind of permeates everything in your life, doesn't it? Every culture that you go towards, I mean, Britain's particularly bad for it. We we all follow rules, um, un- unless it's important things like coronavirus stuff, and then we don't follow the rules. But <laughs> all, all all the other kind of rules we we follow to the letter because we're taught to follow rules. And I think it come comes down to, I mean, this is a huge topic to even try and talk about on a podcast. Yeah. It come it comes down to the culture that's maybe even the culture of the entire country, the the culture of the entire subset of society of whatever you feel like you uh, feel like you connect with or, or whatever that might even be. And to change that, 
or to even report on that, like the kind of thing that you're trying to do, that's a huge thing to 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 figure out. Tell me about it. That's why the, the, <laughs> I thought I thought coaching basketball for ten years was gonna was causing gray hair, but the one <laughs> and a bit year of being in the tech industry and culture measurement side is is already rapidly sped along the graying process, especially on the sides. Probably can't see it on the camera, but it's happening. Yeah. Um, and and one quick thought on that too was that that I had as you were talking was there's it's, it, there's not like a rocket science solution. Like it's not that challenging. And I, I'm going to use a, a polarizing figure in Joe Biden as an example, because I don't know if they're, I don't know if they his administration is going to have done a good job or whatever that means by the time they're done. But I'll tell you right now, either somebody in his camp or him himself, I like to believe him himself said, we need to get creative with how we solve some of these problems. We need to bring somebody in. That's going to give us this, these, this perspective flip that allows us to do things a little bit differently. It's still government. So the differently, it has a different definition in government (laughs) than it does for pretty much everybody else. But what does he do as a older white male? Who's been a part of the establishment in Washington for a long time. He goes out and finds a vice president that could not be more opposite of him if he tried. And I don't know if it's going to work, but I know that that solution and that the creativity that he had at a time where I think it really, really matters Mm. to, to approach it with that mindset. I don't think that people pay enough attention to the fact that it really mattered who he picked maybe more than any other leader, vice president or, or second level leader in the history of the planet. I, I don't know if there is a more important choice than the one he made for vice president because, and, and, and that's saying a lot, but the solutions, the ability to solve with a different perspective that that choice made to bring Kamala Harris in and what she stands for and who she is, and when I say who she is, I definitely do mean a woman, a, a Indian black woman who is, I think, 30 years his junior almost, something like that, <laughs> like 25 years his junior. Everybody is from Joe Biden, though. He's like yeah, 200 or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, that, that can be one of the major solutions to injecting creativity and improving culture. Because culture does improve with inclusion and diversity. That's it's 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 a quick solution. If somebody were to ask me how can we improve our culture right away, my my question with a question would be how how diverse is your is your group right now? Because it's really really hard to improve culture if everybody in the room is an old white guy. <laughs> Looking at you, U.S. Senate. I'm gonna finish it on old white guy there. Good, good end. Old white. We do, you know that that felt like really serious. That, but I, th- I think we 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 got through a lot of cool stuff. Do you do you want to pum- push anything or promote anything in this last twenty seconds? I don't uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we can people if people liked what I said, they can uh, they can find me somewhere. The links are in the show notes to where you can find Ken anyway. Uh, And yeah, cheers, Ken. And we'll chat again soon. Yeah, I appreciate you a lot. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's been been a lot of fun. I haven't had a serious conversation like this on the podcast for for ages. Uh, It's usually all about creativity or whatever, but we talked about the serious side of it. Anyway. Pretty pretty good for two guys that didn't have a plan. (laughs) Yeah.